Well, hi guys. <clears throat> it is a cold, gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this chilly Saturday morning. That would be October 23rd, 2021. And the little dog and I, uh, we actually have a, <clears throat> a hot date with our newest Doomer chick forever. And uh, I got to get ready for my hot date. So might be a little bit rushed on this week's <clears throat> Hopium Roundup, round, where every Saturday I just go through the mainstream media looking at all the various ways uh, <clears throat> we're going to get uh, out of this train wreck. And we're going to start, we're going to start with the BBC News. They're over there in India looking at the nightmare of India's tallest rubbish mountain. I uh, wish you could, that the photos wouldn't work. Okay, you should see the photos of this thing. <clears throat> More than 16 million tons of trash make up Denor's rubbish mountains. Eight of them spread over a 300-acre sprawl that are said to be India's largest and oldest. Waste is piled up as high as 120 feet. The sea forms the outer edge of the mountains and slums have been built into the sturdy heaps of garbage. The decomposing waste releases noxious gases such as methane, hydrogen sulfide, and carbon monoxide. In 2016, it erupted in fires that burned for months. Rubbish fires at landfills contributed 11% of particulate matter, a major cause of air pollution in the city, blah, blah, blah. But do not worry, Narendra Modi is to the rescue. The mountains of garbage dotting India's dotting, how about looming over India's cities, will soon be replaced with waste treatment plants. Prime Minister Narendra Modi promised earlier this month. Yes, thank you, Narendra Modi. We're going to turn those mountains of garbage into waste treatment plants. Uh, okay. I was just talking, uh, I think Umer Haik, was he the one talking about that the world has one clean steel, clean steel uh, factory on the planet. So I was trying to figure out what the hell he was talking about and came up with this article. <clears throat> we can make the steel of tomorrow without the fossil fuels of yesteryear. Yes. The modern world has grown around steel bones. Everything from tools and home appliances to skyscrapers and airplanes use the versatile material in their construction. But the process of making steel is a significant contributor to global warming and climate change. Yes, uh, in 2018, uh, it was reported every ton of steel pro produced generates 1.85 tons of carbon dioxide, accounting for about 7% of global CO2 emissions. Uh, this poses not just environmental challenges for our ever-increasing world, it could also impact steel producers' bottom line which is uh, what this is all about, which is why the steel industry is now developing a fossil-free means of making the alloy, one that relies on renewable sourced hydrogen rather than carbon coke. And uh, we have uh, talked about how they get the hydrogen is from natural gas. Uh, anyway, guys, this, this all breaks down 
So this is how the steel industry, how we're going to save the plant, how the steel industry is going to save the planet. Yes, yes, yes. No mention of the word mining. You will not, I don't think you'll find the word mining anywhere in a story about green, clean steel. All right. Uh, let's go out to 2050 and uh, where we find from Axios, these technologies could bring America to net zero emissions by 2050, when of course uh, there will be no planet. Uh, yes, the newest section of a project from Third Way the Bipartisan Policy Project and Clean Air Task Force examines how energy breakthroughs could accelerate America's transition to reach net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The problem is I never really find anywhere in the article how they're going to do this. Uh, okay, but, well, this sounds, this sounds really hopium to me. Uh, the report contains numerous insights. These include each of their modeled net zero scenarios would require clean energy to be deployed at twice the rate that has ever been achieved in the past, but no problem there. If a key breakthrough only occurs in one technology, such as advanced nuclear power, then that would dominate the marketplace for a time. Yes, quote, there is no silver bullet technology. Uh, this really sounds like, uh, like hopium to me. Then, of course, they talk about hydrogen. The report foresees an increase in hydrogen demand of 9 to 22 times above today's levels by 2050. So uh, there you go. Put that one in your hopium pipe. But uh, we don't have to wait till 2050. We're going to go over to the tech tent, whatever the tech tent is, and look at our world in 10 years. Will robots take over most tasks from manual workers over the next decade? Will we find innovative new energy sources to help us battle climate change? And will we really all be living in virtual worlds? This week, Tech Tent gets out its crystal ball and asks some big thinkers to work out what the world will look like a decade from now. And then, of course, uh, let's hear what Mark Zuckerberg has to say. If Zuck is to be believed, by 2031, we will all be living and working in the metaverse, a series of virtual worlds which will become the most important new technology platform since the arrival of the web. There you go. So we're going to be living in the metaverse. Uh, okay, from Zuck. All right, the future of energy. This is what we want to talk about here. All right, with COP26 soon to get underway, the world is focusing on decarbonizing that the economy and that's going to require plenty of innovation in the energy sector. So they talk, this is the BBC, by the way, speaks with Dr. James Dixon, author of a report by the Institute of Engineering 
and technology called Energy Technologies for Net Zero. Yes. Uh, all right. Electric heat pumps. Electric heat pumps are going to save the planet. Uh, and do not forget, quote, every pathway to net zero between now and 2050 demands an enormous increase in the amount of hydrogen production we need, close quote. So scaling up hydrogen production is a must. Uh, he says ridding industry of all use of fossil fuels will not be feasible in the short term, so there will also need to be plenty of innovation in carbon capture and storage. Yes, and as for transport, take a wild guess, electric vehicles. Yes. So, the bottom line, extraordinary levels of innovation and a willingness by consumers to adopt new products such as heat pumps and electric cars will be needed in the battle against climate change. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. Uh... Several stories, uh, several stories on, uh, we're going to finish up, I'm going to finish up with Greta Thunberg. Okay, we just talked about electric vehicles. So, you know, one of the big problems with electric vehicles is that, you know, th these goddamn batteries that they need all of this planet eating stuff to make these batteries. Well, anyway, forget all of that. Uh, we have a new way to save the planet from electric vehicle batteries. Okay, and you heard it first right here. The electric car battery of the future could be made from trees. Electric cars are supposed to help the world go green and stop hurting the planet. Yes. Engineers at Brown University and the University of Maryland are taking that goal to another level with a new proposal for batteries made from trees. Yes. Uh... <laughs> This really sounds like a way to, uh, to save the planet by turning trees into batteries. Uh, should it pass muster as a practical form of energy, it could very well replace rechargeable batteries as we know them. And it is hard to imagine electric cars having a better sales pitch for their green bona fides than saying that their batteries are literally made from trees. Guys, this is not the onion. This is the, the mainstream media cheerleading Hard to imagine electric cars having a better sales pitch for their green bona fides than saying their batteries are literally made from trees. I'm sure the trees might disagree with that. Uh, oh, damn it, I meant to open up with this since I realized that uh, most people listen to about three minutes of my videos. I am not making this up from the week. It is right here in the main. It, it has taken me how many years? 
man, I'm not going to start this rant over, but for the six or seven people on the planet still listening to me, how the economics of global warming are unfolding in Russia, the ever-present threat of climate change is a danger to all of us, but meanwhile, over in Russia, the economics of global warming are playing out differently, writes the New York Times. <clears throat> Winter heating bills in Russia are on the decline. Russian fishermen have found a modest pollock catch in thawed areas of the Arctic Ocean and in Russia's far north where rapidly rising temperatures have opened up a panoply of new possibilities. Potential mining and energy projects abound the most profound prospects being year-round Arctic shipping as an alternative to uh, the Suez Canal. Multiple government-supported companies across the Russian Arctic, in fact, are midway through a plan to invest the equivalent of $10 billion over five years developing the North East Passage, a shipping lane, you know, we talked about that uh, last week. And the thawing ocean has also made oil, natural gas, and mining ventures more profitable. Yes. And analysts estimate that at least half a dozen large Russian energy shipping and mining companies will all benefit from climate change. The Russian government is not blind to the threat by global warming, but they seem to be enjoying things while they still can. <laughs> There you go. The Russian government obviously been listening to Collapse Chronicles, getting out there and enjoying it while they still can, profiting where possible. Still said Arctic analyst Mariosi Maddox, quote, the evidence suggests the risks far outweigh the benefits no matter how optimistic the Russian government's language. Yes, so good for the Russian government enjoying it while they still can. Uh, all right. I was absolutely thrilled to read this headline from good old Cosmopolitan magazine. Quoting a, uh, quoting a, a recently married woman, I am so worried about climate change, I don't know if I want to be a mom anymore. And uh, so it quotes in here, this is a long story, you know, about whether or not, uh, you know, the decision to have children that more and more uh, couples are deciding not to have children, which really is hopium. Uh, this is a long, involved article. And then, of course, this, this absolutely bungled thing. Is not having children really a way to fight climate change? And uh, so Cosmo uh, weighing in on this, uh, the most dangerous subject. Obviously, guys, not having children is so far and away not only the best way, it is the only way to fight climate change at this point. The only way. And uh, so Cosmo, uh, you know, they... They, they, they try everything they can to avoid it. So what they come up with is, is it doesn't make any difference at this point. At this point, uh, here, here is this mother, you know, back at the end of the story, revisiting this young 
woman deciding whether she wants to be a mother, and here is what she has come up with. Quote, you can decide to have a child or not have one, and both of them would be an empowering act of courage. There is not a right and a wrong. Don't base your decision on whether, you know, on whether to have kids on the climate crisis. It should be a decision of love. You will feel grief either way. There you go. You will feel grief either way. So just allow both possibilities and make the right choice for you. Yes. And then Cosmo wrapping it up. For someone experiencing climate anxiety, it is hard to look at the future staying positive, but it is important to remember that the climate crisis, as horrible and urgent as it is, is not the only nor the first adversity that the human race has endured. The path ahead is not smooth, but we're not all doomed. We're not all doomed, even if it feels that way sometimes. Not having a child or having a child are both valid decisions, and both can be an act of defiance. But uh, we're going to wrap up with a video. I'm going to have to move. Uh, this is a video. It's four minutes. I'm just going to play the last half of it. Climate change leaves youth fearing for the future. And we're going to let Greta Thunberg, Greta Thunberg, we're going to let Greta wind up uh, today's hopium rant. So who this is starting off is one of these uh, psychotherapists uh, dedicating her life to counseling young people about how not to uh, put a bullet through their head, I guess. So, uh, let's see. I guess this is as loud as I can make this. I am such a professional here at Collapse Chronicles with my high techery. Okay, wrap it up. Greta Thunberg. Thus, she is working to help young people manage their climate-related emotions. 75% worldwide think the future is frightening. Four out of ten are hesitant to have children because of climate change. Hell yeah! And over half, 56% of children and young people worldwide think that humanity is doomed. Humanity is doomed, Over half right. of those surveyed, 64%, say governments are failing young people. One young person who isn't afraid to hold governments to account is climate change activist Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg! She says she has experienced severe climate anxiety. It's a quite natural response because as you see as the world is today that no one seems to, to care about what's happening. I think it's only human to feel that way. For now, she is hopeful because she is doing everything she possibly can. There you go. Greta Thunberg is hopeful. And as long as Greta Thunberg is hopeful, we should all be hopeful. And we should all uh, do what the Russian government is doing. And get out there and enjoying it while we still can. I'm like a little dog and I have to wrap this up because we have to go enjoy meeting our newest Doomer chick forever. Bye, guys.